I'm very, very excited to welcome you uh, to the third of our offerings as part of the regular colloquium series for the Center of uh, Migration and Development directed by Eddie Tejas, who is here. And I just want to attract your attention uh, to the fabulous poster here uh, and the many offerings that we have this term. It's really very, very crowded, uh, but in a good way. Uh, and do remember that uh, a few days from now, March 12th, uh, Alondra Nelson from Columbia University will be here to deliver a presentation called Janus DNA, Race and Reconciliation After the Genome. So thank you for being here. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Roberto Gonzalez, who is not in need of an introduction. He is now a preeminent uh, figure in the field of immigration and stratification, education, and other specializations. Uh, and for those who sometimes harbor uh, the suspicion that sociologists do not appreciate qualitative research, well, you are wrong because Professor Gonzalez is mostly a qualitative sociologist whose research focuses on the ways in which legal and educational institutions shape the everyday experiences of poor minority and immigrant youth along the life course. He has an extensive biographical resume and uh, many accomplishments, but instead of uh, wasting his time, with further description of his stellar trajectory, <coughs> let me give him the floor. His presentation is entitled, most originally, The Law and the Clock, Undocumented Immigrants, Youth, and the Transition to Illegality. Please help me welcome Professor Gonzalez. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia, for the very, very, very kind introduction. And, and, and thank you both, Eddie and, and, and Patricia, for the, uh, the invitation. We were supposed to do this last year, uh, but because of scheduling contact, um, I, I'm, I'm here today. Um, and it's really great to be here, and I, I appreciate people coming out today. Um, truth be told, um, I probably be happy anywhere other than Boston right now. Um, it's been a long and brutal last four weeks. Um, we've gotten about a hundred inches of snow, um, a record, um, in about three, three, most of the hundred inch, inches in about three weeks. Um, I've got a son who's a year old and this is his first, first winter, so he really got acclimated to New England. Um, I want to talk today about um, the relationship between time um, and the law. Um, time in immigration studies um, is often assumed as we talk about issues of, of assimilation and incorporation. Um, for me, my trajectory and, and thinking about my involvement in the lives of young people who don't have legal status spans 22 years. Um, so after college in the early 90s, um, I moved to Chicago and I worked as a, as a youth worker. I lived and worked in the same community for, for 10 years. Um, and our neighborhood on the near northwest side of Chicago, um, largely Mexican immigrant neighborhood, a port of entry community for, for Mexican immigrant families. Um, I ran a large youth program. I actually had two jobs, one down my alley and the other four blocks away, um, where um, I really lived and worked um, in the community and saw um, many intimate details of family life within this community. Um, and so over the years, in working with kids, started noticing that a lot of our neighborhood youth were hitting barriers. Um, at around 14, 15, 16 years old. Um, this is the early to mid 90s, and so there's no in-state tuition in the state of Illinois. Uh, while there was an awareness of undocumented communities, there was little work being done on behalf of undocumented children. And it really wasn't an issue that people were paying attention to. Nevertheless, these young people were um, uh, we're confronting some very, very uh, 
serious circumstances as they came of age. Um, fast forward a few years and I find myself in, in graduate school um, in California. Um, and I start hanging out in Santa Ana, California. Any, any folks from the West Coast here? Santa Ana Unified um, school system is about 92% Latino, high 80% free or reduced lunches, um, high immigrant population, many undocumented families. And so I started meeting young people with very similar trajectories. Had come to the U.S. at six months old, two years old, five years old, had grown up side by side with American-born peers, but again at around 14, 15, 16 years old, as their friends were starting to get driver's licenses, getting their first jobs, um, getting financial aid for college, starting their careers, they stayed stuck. Um, so it's this context that I want to talk about, um, the research that I began in 2003. Um, so I've been following a group of, of uh, about 150 young adults uh, since late 2002, early 2003. Um, and so I want to share what I've learned in the last 12, uh, 12 years. So I mentioned time. So as I mentioned before, time uh, is often a central variable. Sociologists, scholars of immigration, um, in thinking about immigrant incorporation and adaptation, um, time is looked at as a, as a central variable. Often we look in terms of intergenerational mobility. Um, scholars, Frank Bean and others, argue that for certain groups, undocumented immigrants, uh, Mexican Americans, that uh, over the course of three or four generations uh, may enter into the mainstream. Right? Um, there, are, there are folks in the room um, who have different ideas and have found um, very, very different findings in terms of, of Mexicans in particular across generations. Um, policymakers will stress that change takes time and that the policy process is incremental. These ideas are really important and all fine and good, but these ideas don't square with the experiences of the young people that I've been, uh, that I've spent the last 12 years talking to. Think back to 2001. 2001, um, before September 11th, there was a lot of hope to pass um, a DREAM Act. So this legislation introduced 14 years ago to provide a pathway to legalization for um, young immigrants who came to the US at young ages. Right. Um, it's been 14 long years. And meanwhile, these young people have played the waiting game. 14 years um, is about 5,000 days. So 5,000 days navigating um, very difficult, untenable circumstances between illegality and belonging. So my study very briefly, um, again, began in, in late 2002, early 2003. Um, I carried out my last follow-ups uh, in November of 2014. Um, I've followed uh, 150 um, young adults. Most of them are in their 30s now. Um, all of these young people came to the U.S. before the age of 12. Um, the vast, vast majority, except for I think eight Central Americans, the vast majority are Mexican. Um, and all grew up in the five county Los Angeles metro metropolitan area. Um, and um, for most of their childhood, adolescent, and adult years have lived in, in some undocumented status. Um, I followed two groups of young people, a group of high achievers, um, who are much more familiar with these young people, commonly known as dreamers. Um, and then half of my sample um, is made up of young people who left the school system at or before high school graduation. So I wanted to look at the, the the, the different trajectories of very high achievers versus those um, who have not done so well in school or had to leave the school system. Uh, interested here primarily in mechanisms. Right? Um, what are the factors that allow a group of young people 
um, to be able to move from high school to college? Um, and what are those that are impeding some of these, these young people with that status? Um, so, um, of the 11, estimated 11.2, 11.4 million, roughly 2.1 million of the undocumented population has been here since childhood. And this is really important. I really want to underscore this point because we often talk in terms of 11 million, we hear it on Fox News, 11 million undocumented workers. The reality is that 16% um, or more um, has been in this country since childhood, <coughs> growing up in the U.S. All right? Is that these young people are, are really, their, um, their lives in the U.S. are really a uh, result of unintended consequences. So um, Doug Massey and others have made this point uh, very effectively uh, that our immigration laws have, have changed over the last several years, um, in particular the tightening on a, of our border, um, and as a result, migration from Mexico, what was once uh, circular in nature, has been interrupted. Right? And so um, we've built longer, taller, and thicker fences on the border. Um, we've spent more money on putting more bodies, more agents on the border, and we have invested billions of dollars in technology. And we now have, have drones for our southern border. As a result, um, as, as, as Doug and others have argued, um, it's become a lot more dangerous, a lot more difficult, and a lot more costly to cross. Labor demand doesn't change right, until 2007, 2008, right? what changed were the auspices under which people arrived, right? So instead of making trips back and forth much more difficult, much more costly, much more dangerous, is that people brought their families to the U.S., right? So what we see over the last, um, accelerating through the 90s and the early uh, half of the 21st century, right, is a growth of the settled uh, undocumented population. We have, for the first time, large numbers of children who will grow up without legal immigration status in the United States. So, so here's a big part of the dilemma. 1982, the Supreme Court ruled in Plyler versus Doe that states could not deny undocumented children the right to a K through 12 education. Right? As such. Tens of thousands of young people each year move through um, our school system. Plyler's reach was limited. Plyler, Plyler didn't address education beyond K through 12, and did not address life beyond school. Right? So while um, undocumented children can go through K through 12 education, they can't drive legally in most states, can't, can't legally work, um, can't get financial aid for college, can't travel outside of the country. Um, so our laws treat children and adults differently, but don't account for the continuity of children becoming adults. So these young people, um, again, live their lives very uncomfortably between experiences of belonging and illegality. And so let me, let me unpack that a bit. So as members of the 1.5 generation, these young people face two difficult tasks, right? Um, acculturating to the, uh, the norms and culture of U.S. society, but also making <coughs> social transitions through adolescence and adulthood. Each year lived in the United States takes them further and further away from the realities of their parents. They speak much more English, they watch more American TV, their culture is a hybrid. Paradoxically, though, each year living in the United States brings them closer and closer to their parents' reality. Mm -hmm. right? So growing up entails a fundamental shift. So I want to talk about, um, uh, share what I've learned from, from my respondents. Um, my respondents grew up in, um, uh, Los Angeles neighborhoods. Uh, they went to school side by side with American-born peers. They date. They dated. They socialized. They grew up to Barney and the Power Rangers. Right? Um, 
when talking about their childhood, right, it was very clear and very striking their attachments to place. Right? So uh, geographer um, Yifu Tuan um, talks about these place attachments. Um, he says that abstract knowledge about a place can be acquired in short order if one is diligent, to be sure. But the feel of place, it takes much longer to acquire. It's made up of these experiences that are mostly fleeting and undramatic, repeated day after day after a span of years. Right? It's a unique blend of sights and sounds and smells, a unique harmony of natural and artificial rhythm. Um, sunrise and sunset um, of work and play. And so what he's talking about, he says the, the feel of place, right? the feel of one place is registered in one's muscles and, and one, one's bones. Um, I bet probably most of you are not from Princeton. But if I asked you to talk about the places where you grew up, you got these sensory memories right, of your childhood. Right? And this is for my respondents, this is, this is what they talk about. This is what they articulated very strong attachments to place. So here's Danny describing her neighborhood. She says, our neighborhood was kind of weird. We had a huge alley in the back that was only for people who lived there. It was fenced off so people from the outside couldn't come in and cars couldn't drive through. There was a gate with a lock so people couldn't get in. The fence had an opening, though, like a hole we could squeeze through. My mom liked it because she didn't have to worry so much. It felt safe to her. Right? These are intimate details that only an insider would know. Right? She said that growing up, all the kids would go back there and play. You know, tag, hopscotch, whatever. Even though we were in downtown LA, um, we could leave our stuff there without it getting stolen. We all knew each other because everyone went to the same elementary school. Right? And the same junior high. Sometimes there would be drama, like disagreements or whatever, but we all got along for the most part. She said, I still see some of them I've been knowing since we were kids. So Danny's history in downtown LA spans many years, right? and she feels deeply connected. She's connected to spaces, but also uh, the people or friends that she grew up with. And here's Pedro really underscoring this point. Talking about his neighborhood, he says, it had problems. Right, sure, but it's where I'm from. He said, I left when I was 14 and I came back at 26. My face hasn't changed much. I mean, I've grown up and everything. But people recognize me. They come up to me and they say, hey, are you Pedro? I used to live around you. Or, oh, I remember when we were just a kid. You've really filled out. He's a very, very large man. Um, I love my old neighborhood. I know my way around here. I know the people. And I know the streets like the back of my hand. It's where I'm from. And so in Pedro's discussion of his neighborhood, the people that are coming up to him said, I, I used to know you when you were a kid. And is this attachment to place extends both ways. It's not only something that's in his head or Danny's head or any of these other young people. Right? It's that they have relationships where people, people recognize them, people remember them. Right? They're part of these communities. But as young people like Pedro started to grow older, hitting 14, 15, 16 years old, um, they faced this dramatic change in these experiences. And I don't want to romanticize these experiences because to be sure, the young people in my study grew up in poverty. Is that they grew up in, what does it mean to grow up in households where um, one or both of your parents are undocumented, uh, multiple moves. Right? Um, but nevertheless, they grew up in ways that really allowed them to grow roots in their communities. Um, but at 14, 15, 16 years old, um, as one of my respondents said, he, he, um, this experience, is, experience was like waking up to a nightmare. And so here's Rodolfo. His, his friends call him Rudy. Rudy says, well, you know what? He said, I never actually felt like I wasn't born here. Because when I came here, I was like 10 and a half. I went to school. I learned the language. But I first felt like I was really out of place when I graduated from high school, when I tried to get a job. So I asked, why was that? He said, well, 
He said, because I didn't have a social security number. Right? He said, well, I didn't even know what that meant. Uh, you know, social security, legal, illegal. I asked my mom, and she said it's in the process. In the process. I don't even know why she would tell us that. Right? So you've got parents of, of young people like Rudy who had come to the U.S. really in the wake of the last legalization. Mm -hmm. Really believe that their fortunes would change over the years, and by the time their kids were entering into um, adult life, they would have had it figured out, right? As Rudy's parents would say, they would have had their papers fixed. Yeah. But for most of these families, this did not happen. This legislative change did not happen in their life. And and Rudy's story is that unfortunate one is that his parents sent a lot of money into a, um, a notary public, uh, a local notario, who ended up taking a lot of money and never, obviously never delivered anything. <coughs> so you see young people like Rudy, um, his parents brought him to the US so him and his brother could have better lives. He looks at his parents and he sees that he's got education that far surpasses them, theirs. Um, that he speaks English uh, with much greater fluency, but here he is with the same narrow, uh, narrowly circumscribed range of options. Um, and so here he's talking about his work. He says, but when I actually wanted to get a job, I couldn't. I couldn't because I didn't have a social security number. So my first job was cleaning carpets, helping out my dad. And so cleaning carpets, helping out my father. Um, so, he sees cousins, he sees his friends, maybe they didn't do super well in school, uh, but they've got much better jobs, and here he is at the level of, of his parents. And so here's Sergio, and Sergio told me about this 1957 Chevy, and his a retired postal carrier owned his car, and he begged this gentleman for weeks and weeks and weeks, I really, really, really want to buy your car. Um, Never mind, he was only 14 at the time. Um, the gentleman agreed. He said, look, come up with, a, with, with half the money. So I'll sell it to you for $5,000. Come up with half the down payment we can talk. So he saved up money uh, with uh, paper routes and other kinds of small jobs, working with family over the weekend. Um, he came up with all, by the time he was uh, uh, able to get his work permit, or his, his driver's permit, he had almost half saved. He gets to the DMV and he realizes that he can't get a driver's license without, without his, his nine digits. And so here he is talking about it. He says, that really sucked. I had been all like, I'm going to get my car before all of you, to all of his friends. But I couldn't. It was unfair and I had to, you know, what could I do? How could I tell them that I can't, that I can't drive? I can't get my license. It really messed me up. So in his colloquial language, these terms like, that really sucked, that really messed me up, these powerfully underscore the frustration and disappointment, right? And this jarring reality, seeing life one way, moving forward with peers, and seeing peers move forward but staying stuck, right? That really sucked and that really messed me up, seemed very apropos to this experience. Um, in addition to legal barriers, um, the one thing about my research I think that, that has struck me the most is the secrets that these young people keep. And the secrets that they keep from um, close friends, from romantic partners, um, from teachers. Um, and as a result, these, these secrets, um, seeing friends drive, but not talking about why they're on the bus, right, or making up excuses for not taking a dream job in the summer, making excuse for being the salutatorian of your college but going to community college. Right? Is that as a result, this stigma management really very, very narrowly, very much narrowly narrowed their world. Here's Grace. She says, I just stopped going out. I was tired of asking for a ride and coming up with an excuse. And every time it was a hassle with my friends. They wouldn't let it go. So I started telling them I was too busy with school. 
At first they didn't like that, but after a while they stopped inviting me. I end up spending a lot of weekends by myself because most of my friends don't call me anymore. And it's become such a hassle um, to explain everything to people. It's also affected the way I am when I meet new people. I used to be very outgoing, but now I try to keep my guard up. I try not to get too close to people. I saw Grace a couple of weeks after my first interview with her on our college campus. She looked very distraught, and we, we went to a cafe and to sit down and talk, and she explained to me that she had broken up with her boyfriend a couple of days prior. She said that she had come really close to telling her boyfriend that she, they had dated for almost a year. That she had come very, very close to telling him about her status, to disclose this very, very um, tough secret of hers. Um, but she really, there was something about the relationship, something about it that just wasn't right, not yet. Um, so they were together on a Saturday having breakfast at his place, and a segment on immigration comes on the, on the TV. And he starts yelling at the television about those damned illegals. They need to send them all back to Mexico. Well, imagine how she felt. And this was somebody that she was very close to. She told me that the next day that she quietly broke up for him with him. She said that she had become too busy with school and work, and she was having a hard time balancing the relationship. Um, but for Grace and others, the stigma management serves as a secondary border reinforcing these legal exclusions, right, is that not only are these young people being excluded by the law from driving and working, et cetera, et cetera, um, but they're also withdrawing from critical um, social ties um, that, that have been instrumental in their development and their growing up, right, and withdrawing from really important um, social activities. Um, so what I've described so far is, is what I call the transition to a legal. This is just this graphically <coughs> representing what we've talked about. So moving um, from K through 12 schools um, through these very defining adult rites of passage um, and really waking up to this succession of, of, of blocked opportunities. Um, fear and stigma and <coughs> change social commitment patterns and, and these physical and emotional manifestations of stress. Um, when I started this study, I was really interested in questions of, of mobility, um, looking at educational attainment, looking at civic and political participation, um, looking at, at, at job mobility. And what I found almost to the person was that all of the young people that I talked to described some physical or emotional manifestation of stress. Mm -hmm chronic headaches, two things, trouble sleeping, trouble getting out of bed, eating problems, attempted suicide. Um, but before I, I paint a, a really gray cloud, I want to uh, talk about the, the different experience among, experiences among my sample, and I also want to um, get to DACA. Um, Rob Smith was here a couple weeks ago and talked about DACA. Um, so I want to first look at the young people that I call early exiters. And these are the young people, again, from my sample, and this does not show up too well. Um, uh, those who, who left school at or before high school graduation. Um, and so want to look for a minute at the, at the mechanisms. So for many of these young people, and this is a much more, these early exiters are a much more diverse group than the college goers. Right? These are young people who left high school um, uh, because they had to start working um, to help out their parents, um, young people who um, started their families as, as teenagers, young people who started at a community college but couldn't afford to keep up the fees, um, young people who had trouble with the law. So this is a very, very diverse group. But for many of these young people, and this is Los Angeles public schools, right? Mm -hmm. The LA schools, uh, in the 90s. If you think about some of these schools like Belmont High School. Belmont High School, the height of, of the, the mid, late 90s, 5,400 students went to Belmont High School. So what does it mean 
when you're not tracked into AP, you're not in an international baccalaureate program, you're not in a gifted and talented program. In California, the student to counselor ratio is 950 to 1. <laughs> so what does it mean when you're in a larger class, um, you have grown up with a family secret that you don't readily share? Right? You don't have opportunities to build trusting relationships with adults, with teachers, with counselors. So many of these young people fall through the cracks. Um, the lure of work, um, and for many the necessity to work at 14, 15 years old, um, and not having that, that important adult figure in their life as a, as a counterbalance to some of these, these pulls. Right? So for many of these young people, entering into this adult world of illegality um, at 15, 16 years old, so starting this, this world, so as a result, Many of these young people didn't have opportunities to, to develop trust in adults, um, really left to fend for themselves at very early ages. Um, daily contact with legal limitations that, in their words, really beat them <coughs> up over time right? and forced underground. In contrast, so here are these college goers and, and other my college going respondents, um, almost to the person that these young people could name upwards of three, four, five mentors that they had in that school. Right. Smaller learning environments in school, shielded from the more general population. The opportunity for, to form relationships with teachers, mm -hmm. from which many of these young people, when they started encountering these barriers and frustration, were able to reach out to teachers, were able to reach out to their guidance counselors that they had relationships with. Mm -hmm. Look, I'm undocumented. Um, I want to go to college. I can't get financial aid. Um, this is my situation. I really, really need help. And so in many cases, their teachers um, pass the proverbial hat around in the teacher's lounge to help them <coughs> come up with money for books or even to pay for a first semester tuition in school. Right? Help them to navigate the very difficult transition from K through 12 to college. Right? And so for many of them, these adult figures and being in these smaller learning environments help them to access these resources, scarce resources at their school, schools that were really critical to making this transition from K through 12 to higher ed. As a result, a lot of these young people formed really, really important social networks in their lives, mm -hmm. right? Developed resiliency. And by resiliency, what I mean is that getting knocked down, having someone help pick you up, getting knocked mm -hmm. down again, having someone pick you up. Right? After the third or fourth time, you develop the ability to start picking yourself up, right? because you've learned those, those skills. And so after high school, my respondents really went this way. Right? So the, the, many of the college goers were able to make seamless transitions to college uh, in a life where they continue learning. They're on beautiful campuses like this. Right? Is it they're um, in the company of peers who are thinking about their futures? It's a great thing that school does. It always has us thinking about some future, some future goal. Right? We study hard as children in grammar school so we can get into the competitive programs, into the magnet programs and the competitive high school. We want a good GPA, we work really hard to get a G good GPA so we can go to a great college. Um, we work really hard in college so that we can land good jobs, we can build resumes for good jobs. College goers, on the other hand, started work and started working um, low wage, um, uh, low skilled um, <coughs> jobs in factories and restaurants. Um, uh, where they came into daily contact with legal limitations. Um, but eventually, most of these young people end up in the same place. And so here's Oscar talking about his work experience. He says, I never thought I'd have to do physical labor. It's really tough. I come home from work tired every day. I don't have a life. I don't do anything <coughs> referring to any social activity. 
and now I have back problems. I've tried to get something better, but I'm limited by my, my situation. Jeanette says, she's, she says, I can't believe this is my life. When I was in school, I never thought I'd be doing this. I mean, I was never an honors student, but I thought I'd have a lot better job. It's really hard, you know. I make beds, I clean toilets. And the sad thing is when I get paid. And she says, I work this hard for nothing. Look at me. She says, look at my face. I'm 24 years old and I work this hard. So I said, as I said earlier, as one of my respondents described it, getting really beaten up over the years. Esperanza, um, who I met my first day of graduate school at Irvine. We were riding the bus together, and I stayed, I stayed in contact with her. Um, and I'll tell you in a minute where she is now, as I wind up. I, I don't realize we're short on time. Um, she graduated from the University of California um, with a bachelor's in, in, in journalism. Um, in the years following graduation, she could only get jobs in restaurants and factories. Mm -hmm. And here she is describing these, these experiences. She says the people working at those places, like the cooks and the cashiers, they're all really young, and I feel really old. Like, what am I doing there if all the others are like 16, 17 years old? The others are like senoras, who are, are 35. <laughs> <laughs> They've dropped out of school, but because they have little kids, they're still working at the restaurant. Thinking about that, it makes me feel so stupid. And the factories, too, they ask me, ¿Qué estás haciendo aquí? What are you doing here? Right? You can speak English. You graduated from high school. You can work anywhere. Esperanza, and, and for Spanish speakers in the room, uh, the pseudonym that I give her means hope. Right? Is, is, is not without irony. Okay? Her biggest accomplishment today, that which makes her mom the most proud, when she applies to these kinds of jobs, she leaves her bachelor's degree off her applications because she knows that she's not competitive. So very, very quickly, 2012, right, the landscape, since 2012, the landscape has changed. Um, I've got another study where we've surveyed 2,700 DACA-eligible young adults. Uh, 2,400 of them have DACA, and we're finding that many of these young people are they're getting jobs, they're increasing their earnings, they're getting driver's license. They're taking really important steps to the mainstream. For these respondents, who are largely in their 30s now, DACA has not proved to be a very significant boost in their lives. Um, only two of my early exiters um, have DACA, and about a little over half of my college and most of them rationalize that at this point in their lives they don't know what it's going to mean for them. And they weigh the $465 cost of the application with what they see might be a benefit for them. And many of these young people are living check to check. So $465 is a lot of money. Back to Esperanza. Esperanza, who, who I've known since since 2002, um, since we, we met on the bus, and, and it was actually months later that I, maybe more than a year later, I found out that she was undocumented, is now in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. She's not really there, but she's somewhere in the Midwest. I say that she's in Milwaukee. Um, she moved to Milwaukee for, um, she moved to Milwaukee two and a half years ago to be close to her. Um, her mom and sisters were there, and she had spent a lot of time in activism in California, had gotten burnt out, um, had planned to spend one more year in the United States. Um, her, her thir she had planned to turn 30, spend one more year in the U.S., and then move to Canada. Um, DACA was announced, and she's, she's very excited. She says, you know how, you don't know how, you have no idea how thankful I felt I got included in that, because she just barely met the cutoff at 31. I remember the day. She said, I logged on to Facebook in the library, and my friend messaged me, and she congratu congratulated me on barely making it. She sent me the memo to make me believe it, and when Obama finally made the announcement after taking forever, I was watching, still incredulous, 
that I had made it in. She's had a really difficult time at 31 years old with a college degree and trying to apply for jobs she felt matched her education. Um, she found that she was not competitive for those kinds of jobs. Right? Over the years, she's been employed by several different places. She's had several restaurant jobs, several factory jobs. She's worked in um, the hospitality industry and hotels. But she didn't have the experience needed to be competitive for the kinds of jobs that she wanted. Um, she has a, a three-year-old now. Um, the father of the child um, was a legal permanent resident, um, was deported after a charge of transporting an illegal alien. He was giving a, a, a co-worker a ride home. Um, and so she feels very happy that she has DACA, but it's been a very mixed bag for her um, now at 33. So I just want to wrap, wrap up really quickly. So thinking about the experience of time um, and really the experiences of these young people challenge a lot of what we, we know um, about time and the relationship between um, the attainment of human capital and progress. Right? Is it for these young people, this delayed or blocked mobility um, caused by their lack of legal status it has really prevented, uh, has really leveled their educational <coughs> motivations for, for many of them. It has stressed parent and child relationships, right, and it's contradicted the notions of a small c citizenship. These processes are also rendering our measures of intergenerational mobility um, by educational progress irrelevant, right, by breaking this assumed link between educational attainment and any material or psychological outcomes after school. Um, um, this talk I give to a lot of different audiences and I like to also provide some implications for those people who are working directly. Um, this policy, this whole policy narrative, and especially this idea that change takes time and is incremental there's been a lot of effort by a lot of really great people to try to move immigration reform forward. And this is, this is in the news this week in, in a big way. Um, and people believe that we're very close to having a DREAM Act passed. Um, if any immigration legislation moves through, it would certainly be a DREAM Act. But meanwhile, as I mentioned earlier, that these young people and their families have to carry out their everyday lives. Right? And so at the level, so moving from a level of policy to the level of, of community, right, is that how do we um, address some of these realities on the ground? Um, and certainly, um, this work has strong implications for um, helping the, the importance of moving uh, more young people, undocumented young people, through the K through 16 pipeline. Is it helping them to make these these important transitions? Um, partnering with community organizations to expand the menu, and especially with DACA now, of legally permissible opportunities. Um, in particular, for people like Esperanza and others, um, job training programs, opportunities for internships, opportunities to have experience uh, that will allow them to to move on and have productive lives. If, if if a bigger change opens up. Um, and then the, the, the mental health aspect of this is really strong, working with local mental health professionals to, to better um, meet the needs arising from this very turbulent transition. Adolescence is a very, very difficult experience. Um, and to layer on top of that all of these legal exclusions and stigma, it's very, very chaotic. And so we really have to identify um, at the level of communities and, this, and schools, resources um, to mobilize around this issue. And then finally, um, implications for our policy. I mean, certainly, um, a mass legalization um, is the tide that, that lifts all boats. 
um, and the Deferred Action for Child Arrivals program is an important step, but it's, it's temporary and partial. It doesn't address financial aid and, and doesn't really provide any form of, of legal immigration status. Um, uh, the, the DREAM Act would, would certainly cast a much wider net, but the reality is that these young people also belong to families and communities. Uh, and their fates are, are importantly linked to those of their families uh, and their communities. So thinking about some comprehensive solution. So I've talked a lot about legality, uh, and I think that thinking about Eddie's work in particular, so we wave a magic wand and legalize the population overnight, tomorrow, let's say. Um, what is not lost is the vast majority of these, um, these folks living in an undocumented status, um, live in poverty, uh, kids go to schools that are overcrowded, um, that are segregated, we're moving towards more, um, especially in cities, de facto segregated schools, large de facto segregated schools. Right. And so some of these communities Latino communities, Mexican communities in particular, um, Southeast Asian communities, right, is that we provide utilization. Right? We need to be thinking about the next steps. And so those that are advocating for a change, and for such a long time people trying to appeal to our legislators to pass the DREAM Act by saying this will only affect a small slice of the population that we should be thinking much, much broader than that. Uh, and think about the real, real, um, real consequences of having 11 or more, 11 plus million people living in undocumented residence. Uh, and the relationship between class, race, and immigration status. I've talked a lot. Uh, my wife teases me that I talk slow when I talk. <laughs> I really appreciate your patience. I'd be happy to. Happy to have a conversation with you. Before it's open? Oh, it was wonderful. Thank you. Questions? Amanda? Thank you so much for your talk. I'm excited that you were able to finally come uh, to speak at the CMP. Um, I had a question about, <coughs> um, in your conclusion, uh, you mentioned that uh, undocumented um, children had this conflicting notions of membership, and I was wondering if you could elaborate on um, that and how does, I guess, facing uh, discrimination and marginalization affect their ties to the nation and their understanding of, um, I guess, of citizenship with the Yeah, 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 absolutely. That's a really important question. I think that this, so this is, is, I can call, okay. So, so this is a really, I think, a very, very central question. I think particularly pertinent to college goers. I mean, I think that many of them that I talked to um, really saw themselves as, as being included. And really, I think many of them bought into the notions of meritocracy and hard work, but if they worked hard enough. Uh, they continued to get good grades and accolades and all of these awards that they eventually something would happen to change for them. Um, they certainly, um, in Los Angeles, in their communities, um, uh, grew up and their families faced discrimination, but I think that very centrally, that many of them uh, hung on to the hope that um, uh, their participation, that their uh, inclusion would mean something for them. and especially for those who moved through college and all of their hard work was matched with rewards. Right? So they really, in very important ways, very significant ways, felt special all the way through their schooling. Um, only like Esperanza to really fall off a cliff uh, right after college, and some of them actually even through graduate school. Whereas many of the early exiters were conditioned from very early on um, um, to know their place. Many of them were in uh, environment, school environments where um, they didn't have a lot of specialized attention. 
Um, many of them were on the other side of bad exchanges between uh, truant officers, teachers who were burned out, um, police officers in the communities. Right? And so there's more continuity for a lot of the early exodus. I should say another thing that I neglected to mention about a lot of the college schools, that even in these predominantly Latino <coughs> schools that they went to, a lot of the diversity was certainly in the uh, more upper tracks in their <coughs> schools. It's where they had the opportunity to, um, to learn with, to make friendships with peers um, of higher SES background, peers of other nationalities. Um, and so we're able to enter into a world, right, at least for a few hours a day, um, that was inclusive and really make, help them to uh, affirm their sense of belonging and membership. Jessica? Um, I have a similar related question. Um, I was just wondering if any of the students that you talked to in like, um, as a cohort, uh, if they had, what their relationship was with their native country and in what yeah. terms they thought about it and if they, yeah. I know I've met a lot of um, a lot of dreamers that often talk about um, the idea of going back to their country yeah. after graduating high school or college because they feel this sense of non, not belonging and so they yeah. sort of cling to that idea even if they came here at a really early age. Yeah. And then I had a second question um, which was about whether any of the students that you talked to that were involved in the immigrant youth movement, sort of how that involvement in the in the political aspect of this whole battle affected their sense of membership and belonging? Yeah, yeah, those are really great questions. So I think the first, in terms of their relationships with their with their country of origin, and, and for most it's Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, so many of them have seen relatives who have passed, right, and they've been unable to attend funerals, um, there have been events in their countries and they have marriages, weddings, whatever, and they haven't been able to go. Mm -hmm. Many of them have a very, many of the young people that I described, both college goers and early experts alike, very strong national Mexican identity. Mm -hmm. right. Sergio, for one, I talked about Sergio, the, the young, uh, young man who wanted the 1957 Chevy. Um, Sergio had an Aztec calendar tattooed in his back. Um, he had come to the U.S. He was, I think, four years old. And in our early interviews, he talked a lot about how um, he, re he loved Mexican culture and really wanted to go back and was afraid that he would be seen as a pocho, mm -hmm. right? that he wouldn't belong. In a very, very sad irony, Sergio worked, I met him in a continuation school where he was really, really... Uh, he was working very hard to try to get credits to get his high school diploma. Um, Sergio ended up meeting, who, who is now his wife, he has three kids with now, <coughs> uh, at this continuation school. And he strived to turn his life around, start, stopped hanging out with some of the young men that he had grown up with in, in a gang. Um, he, um, for a long time, was not working or driving, he worked only on the weekends, he was living with parents. But he becomes a father and he starts to want to have more adult responsibilities. He gets a job at a factory. His co-worker is a white skinhead guy, very skinhead, I don't know that he's a racist skinhead, but he's got these tattoos on his head. Mm -hmm. They're driving through Anaheim, California, and uh, they get pulled over by the police. The police find a bomb in his car, but also find a pipe bomb. So under the Patriot Act, both of them are charged. Oh three years in prison. Sergio serves three years. And then after that, gets deported to Tijuana. So Sergio's really dreamed of going to Mexico all of his life, but here he finds himself in Tijuana with very little money, no connections, having to start from below scratch and had a very, 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 he, he ended up there two and a half years before he could come back, and he's, he's back in California. Um, on the other side, I, I know many young people last summer through Deferred Action 
um, who were able to take a trip to Mexico. 45 young people, and it was a really uh, amazing experience for a lot of a lot of these young people. Actually, for the first time, being able to to visit relatives, um, to be able to, to to really experience their homeland, um, and I think that it's been a really uh, positive awakening experience. Uh, but I think that the these questions are mixed. The student movement. The student movement, I think, that for a lot of young people, and Esperanza is one. I didn't talk about her, her involvement in in, uh, in activism. But I think that for a lot of these young people, the activism has been what has allowed them to persist mm -hmm. through bad jobs, through exclusions, through run-ins with the police. Right? Is that this is, this is very different from any kind of social movement that their parents may have been part of before. So the drywall workers, um, justice for janitors, um, that there is a community. There's a community that's on campuses like this. There's a community that's in their neighborhoods. There's a community that's national. They can plug into through Facebook or whatever. Right, and share their, their experiences. And I think that, that and the coming out has been huge. We talked about the mental health aspect of this. The, the, the coming out, um, and you know, there are a lot of people in communities who really advise against this coming out and disclosing, this kind of level of disclosure. Um, but it's been very, very cathartic for a lot of young people. It's really kind of helped them to move forward. Unfortunately, a lot of a lot of them cycle in and out because they also need to yeah. they need to work and they need to um, help out their families um, and you know change is long. Really? Thank you, Roberta, for this wonderful presentation. I think like trying to estimate the effect of being undocumented on inequality, I think it's uh, it's very tricky, right? Yeah. I mean, one of the issues is that a lot of these folks they share a lot of. Um, they have a lot, inherit a lot of disadvantage from their parents. You know, it could be that their parents are undocumented, or their parents are have low <laughs> levels of human capital, or they're discriminated against. They themselves live in a very sort of like working class environment. So, so how can we disentangle the effect of just being undocumented from all these different disadvantages that could be shaping their outcomes? And, and I wonder if that one way of doing that would be to find a comparison group that kind of shares the same experience of growing up in a, this kind of disadvantaged neighborhood, but that. Is but that there is documented. It could be like maybe uh, siblings, they're part of the same family, but they for some reason they have they were born here perhaps, or they have uh, documents somehow. I wonder if you, you found any yeah. any people in your sample that have many similarities, but also they differed in this particular respect. Yeah. And, and the second question that I have is sure. about the high achievers. Um, what what made these uh, high achievers? What was it that made them different even in high school? that made them different from the, I guess, the, sure. the, the dropout kids. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so, disentangling inequality is, is a, I think, is a, is a really critical question that a lot of us wrestle with. Um, I mentioned our, our, our DACA survey. Um, we surveyed last year 2,700 DACA eligible young adults. Um, because of the difficulty in a national survey sam sample, um, we've got a sample that's skewed towards the more educated and those that are involved in, in organizations. Nevertheless, um, what we see are distinct advantages uh, among those who have um, uh, highly educated parents, right, have done much better in accessing the benefits of DACA, um, among those who um, have higher degrees, um, those from higher SES families, um, those who belong to organizations. Um, there's also a disadvantage to being Mexican. So among our, our, our sample, uh, Mexicans have done um, slightly worse in terms of accessing these, these benefits. And this is, we, we speculate, it's, it's, it's a matter of access to resources right, within their communities um, and, 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 and social networks. Um, my original sample, my dissertation, um, I interviewed 50 second generation 
uh, Mexican Americans that had at least one undocumented parent. Um, and you see, particularly around the mid 20s, where a lot of these uh, where legality starts to really show up in, 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 in significant ways. Um, siblings who um, were high achievers, um, where uh, the legal sibling was able to really move forward and soar, mm -hmm. while the other stayed stuck and had difficulty accessing financial aid and other kinds of... Um, and then also with lower achieving young people, um, there are two brothers, um, Ramon and Jose. Um, and Ramon is, uh, Ramon has four kids. Um, Jose has three. Um, they grew up in the same neighborhood, obviously. Um, they grew up in gangs. They, um, they came to the United States. They um, were picked on at school because they didn't speak English. They ended up um, starting their own little clique that became a gang, um, got into a fair amount of trouble. Um, over the years, um, they started having families that wanted to be responsible. This is a, a common thread, I think, among a lot of young people we talk to. Um, and um, so the brother who had legal status was able, they went to the same this continuation for the family I um, was able to get a driver's license. Um, he got a certificate in, in, the, in the trades, so he started uh, construction work. Um, and um, has been able to achieve modest amounts of mobility in his life. The one without status became very frustrated at that juncture, didn't finish school, uh, went back to selling drugs because on the street he didn't have anyone bossing him around. He was his own boss. Um, and um, um, it's, it's taken him a long time to get on track. Um, a very similar experience. I think two years separates these two young men. Um, about where one has been able to achieve a modest amount of mobility, the other one has has really moved downward into into depression and drug use, to be honest. So, related to that, yeah. uh, what I, one of the things that I thought was very interesting about your presentation is that there are within-group differences. Yeah. Uh, because all these are undocumented kids, and yet you have the dreamers, and you have the early yeah. exiters. And I, I was overjoyed to see that uh, just in passing you gave attention to the conditions in school, because mm -hmm. I actually should research for this in a paper entitled The Back Pocket Map. Mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, it, 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 the, the, the emphasis is upon how, no matter whether you're documented or not, yeah. the capacity to secure weak ties, mm -hmm. the capacity of, uh, uh, to connect with teachers or counselors yes. or external others who can actually, so I found that that was really very, mm -hmm. very important. Uh, that. The, 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 uh, and we've had that in Princeton, as a matter of fact, that when we had graduations uh, with kids who had graduated sure. are either undocumented or uh, of humble origins, and some of the people present at the graduation ceremonies are those counselors and those teachers who were yeah. responsible for that. I found that. And the other thing was membership, which I think is consistent with your analysis, uh, the membership in ethnic uh, associations. So especially in California, sure. I found that it, which is, was not exactly what I expected because I've always had, until then, some mixed feelings about what it's like to uh, self-define as Chicano sure. for reasons that I'm sure you understand. But it turns out that defining yourself as Chicano among these st students that I uh, uh, oh terribly protected. Yeah. So from for someone like me coming from the outside, it's like Chicano, don't do that stigma, <laughs> la la la. No, sure. no, that's not the way it works. Because defining yourself uh, as a member of a community that appreciates and values you yeah. connects with those uh, with that other element of uh, weak ties, and enables uh, kids to do amazing things, even when they're undocumented. Yeah. Which is the, the kind of the nice <laughs> side to this story.
Roberto, that was, uh, was really interesting. You spoke slowly, but it delivered a lot. Yes, I totally enjoyed it. So, so, um, how, so you did this study in L.A. So what if you had done this in a, in, a city, in, a, in a state where the driver's license or they give driver's license to legal, right? Yeah. There are none. There are none anymore? No, no, for a long time. For a while? Since like uh, 2004. Okay, but, but maybe where there's less restriction. Sure, yeah, yeah, you know, sure. I mean, what, what would be the outcome? Would it be similar? Yeah, it's a good question. L.A. is also really, as you know, yeah, and it, then there's places it, the sprawling nature schools. of LA. Yeah, and the quality of schools varies a lot too. Yeah, yeah, and 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 so many of my respondents were taking buses to college, mm -hmm. two hours or more. Yeah. Right, and so um, it's certainly, and I think that this is a really good question that really underscores the local context, especially over the last few years, as immigration has reform has stalled. And, lo and, and localities, states and localities have seen it upon themselves to try to try to pass immigration laws you get. It means one thing to be undocumented, for example, in New York City. Mm -hmm. right? To be a dreamer in New York City, access to a very strong uh, community college system, yeah. Yeah. access to a very uh, easy and reliable public transportation system, a city that has fought off secure communities, um, uh, a place that prides itself as an immigrant, right, an immigrant destination, right? Very positive context of reception, right. versus yeah. growing up as a dreamer in rural Georgia. Yeah, right. there you go. Two eighty-seven G agreements on the books, right? Exclusion from public universities. Yeah. Um, uh, not very good public transportation options. Mm -hmm. Good. This is, uh, it, it's playing out very differently, and I think that, that, that um, Rob Smith and I um, were giving a talk tomorrow at ESS. Um, well, we've got two very big longitudinal studies in New York and Los Angeles, and, um, and I would love for us to do something together to really look at some of the... Yeah, I think that would be great, uh, and it's not coincidental that um, a lot of the, a lot of the major immigration scholars in the U.S. are from New York, yeah. and that's what they know, and they tend to be very positive. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, 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 that's right. Mm -hmm. Hello, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes. Can we go like this, and like this, and then who, who was next? Yeah, all right. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Uh, I just have one question. Uh, did you explore the rate of a crime uh, from undocumented children uh, when they make transition to adolescent and uh, young adulthood uh, uh, just to compare with other legal immigrant uh, yeah. children? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I did not explore, explore crime rates, and, 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 and my sample is a it's a large qualitative sample, but 150 is a very, very small in uh, to be doing these these kinds of analyses. Um, for my respondents, right, is it driving is a crime, right? For in, in their lives, driving is a crime, working is a crime. Uh, many over the years, I think, because of frustration and depression. Um, Entered into more kind of self-destructive behaviors, uh, but it's a really good question. I, um, yeah, I, 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 I uh, um, I'd be very interested in, in what, what people who are doing that would find out. Thank you. Is there any um, research on the difference in trajectory for these kids depending on the age at which they're told about their legal status, yeah, who tells question. them, and under what conditions they're told? Yeah, it's a really, really good question. Um, I think not. Uh, and I think that it's a terrific, it's a terrific dissertation project. Um, my respondents grew up in LA, and a lot of them in communities where there are multiple generations of Mexican Americans, right? And so in their schools, it was not always assumed that they'd be undocumented because they were Mexican, or even because they were foreign born, right? Um, it's very different. I've heard from colleagues who've done research in, in New Jersey or, or, or other newer destination areas where there's really only one or so generation. And so 
many young people know very early about their status. Um, I also want to point out that although a significant chunk of my respondents did not know about their status until much later, others who told me that they had grown up knowing, for them, their illegality did not become really an issue in their lives right, until matched up with experiences of exclusion. It's one thing theoretically to know and, and also to, to, to know about family problems and, and parental illegality. Um, and to know in theory I, I don't have status and, and this is what it might mean for me, but, but actually to be you know, kind of slapped in the face right, with the genre exclusions as your friends are moving forward is another thing. Um, but I think that it's a critical question and a question I think that a lot of school districts are, are wrestling with as this issue has become more prominent is that how do, how do schools, or not, but, but if they, they want to engage in this, how do they work with families around these, these difficult conversations with kids? Last question, Amanda. Um, I had a question regarding um, the effect of uh, DACA status on um, employment prospects, um, yeah. especially for people who um, got the DACA intervention earlier on in their lives uh, in comparison to Esperanza. And I was wondering, does, um, yeah, I guess, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're not obligated to uh, disclose your legal status when applying for jobs. Um, and given that, does um, DACA status, is that commensurate with um, people who uh, have no prior experience of illegality and being able to obtain jobs? And does, being uh, like having the DACA status uh, complicate uh, or pose challenges to people when negotiating employment, um, given that uh, DACA is not kind of a permanent, uh, uh, doesn't give you permanent stability, but it is this temporary. Sure. Kind of, uh, I think it raises a number of questions, right? Um, what happens when your two years expires, you've applied, but you're waiting, right? you, you move into uh, a liminal legality, to use Cecilia Mendehubar's term, right? Um, what, I, so, so I guess back to your original question, or, or the beginning of your question at least. Um, so many of those who are now documented have social security numbers that they, they can use when they're applying to jobs. Um, and for those who are younger and are able to move more seamlessly into a work situation, um, we'll know more after, uh, after our qualitative interviews. We just started interviews in Arizona, California, Florida, Georgia, New York, and Illinois. And we'll do 100 in each of those, those states. And we'll know in, a lot more by this summer about these kinds of experiences that you're asking. Um, but um, early and anecdotal evidence suggests that those who are younger um, who haven't become frustrated, right? who haven't, um, who don't bear a lot of the weight of illegality, are doing a lot better. Uh, there's a graduate student at Berkeley, um, Esther Cho, mm -hmm. who's done some preliminary research on uh, looking at Korean Americans with DACA versus, I think they were Mexicans and some Central Americans in her, in her sample. Um, and what she found was, interestingly, that a lot of these Korean Americans now with DACA are able to leapfrog a lot of their peers and get good jobs. Why? Because within their communities, they were able to network and get <coughs> jobs with Korean firms in the U.S. Um, they were able to get professional jobs even without status. And so many of them now have uh, requisite job experience that's all, that is going to allow them to, to really build and get better jobs and, and, and better pay. It's a wonderful presentation. We're so happy you came. Thank, Thank you. you very much. for the, uh, the invitation. We were supposed to do this last year, uh, but because of scheduling contact, um, I, I'm here today. Um,
Uh, it's really great to be here, and I, I appreciate people coming out today. Um, truth be told, um, I'd probably be happy anywhere other than Boston right now. Um, it's been a long and brutal last four weeks. Um, we've gotten about 100 inches of snow, um, a record, um, in about three, three, most of the 100 inch, inches in about three weeks. Um, I've got a son who's a year old, and this is his first first winter, so he really got acclimated to New England. Um, I want to talk today about um, the relationship between time um, and the law. Um, time in immigration studies um, is often assumed as we talk about issues of assimilation and incorporation. Um, for me, my trajectory and, and thinking about my involvement in the lives of young people who don't have legal status spans 22 years. Um, so after college in the early 90s, um, I moved to Chicago and I worked as a, as a youth worker. I lived and worked in the same community for, for 10 years. Um, and our neighborhood on the near northwest side of Chicago, um, largely Mexican immigrant neighborhood, a port of entry community for, for Mexican immigrant families. Um, I ran a large youth program. I actually had two jobs, one down my alley and the other four blocks away, um, where um, I really lived and worked um, in the community and saw um, many intimate details of family life within this community. Um, and so over the years, in working with kids, started noticing that a lot of our neighborhood youth were hitting barriers. Um, at all, uh, the vast, vast majority, except for I think eight Central Americans, the vast majority are Mexican, um, and all grew up in the five county Los Angeles metro metropolitan area. Um, and um, for most of their childhood, adolescent, and adult years have lived in, in some undocumented status. Um, I followed two groups of young people, a group of high achievers, um, who are much more familiar with these young people, commonly known as dreamers. Um, and then half of my sample um, is made up of young people who left the school system at or before high school graduation. So I wanted to look at the, the the, the different trajectories of very high achievers versus those um, who have not done so well in school or had to leave the school system. Uh, interested here primarily in mechanisms. Right? Um, what are the factors that allow a group of young people um, to be able to move from high school to college? Um, and what are those that are impeding some of these, these young people with that status? Um, so, um, <coughs> Of the 11, estimated 11.2, 11.4 million, roughly 2.1 million of the undocumented population have been here since childhood. And this is really important. I really want to underscore this point because we often talk in terms of 11 million, we hear it on Fox News, 11 million undocumented workers. The reality is that 16% um, or more um, has been in this country since childhood, <coughs> grown up in the U.S. All right. Is that these young people are, are really their um, their lives in the U.S. are really a uh, result of unintended consequences. So um, Doug Massey and others have made this point uh, very effectively uh, that our immigration laws have have changed over the last several years, um, in particular the tightening on a, of our border, um, and as a result migration from Mexico, what was once uh, circular in nature. I'm very, very excited to welcome you uh, to the third of our offerings as part of the regular colloquium series for the Center of uh, Migration and Development, directed by Eddie Tejas, who is here. And I just want to attract your attention uh, to the fabulous poster here. Uh, and the many offerings that we have this term, it's really very, very crowded, uh, but in a good way. Uh, and do remember that uh, a few days from now, March 12th, uh, Alondra Nelson from Columbia University will be here 
to deliver a presentation called Janus DNA, Race and Reconciliation after the Genome. So thank you for being here. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Roberto Gonzalez, who is not in need of an introduction. He is now a preeminent uh, figure in the field of immigration and stratification, education, and other specializations. Uh, and for those who sometimes harbor uh, the suspicion that sociologists do not appreciate qualitative research, well, you are wrong, because Professor Gonzalez is mostly a qualitative sociologist whose research focuses on the ways in which legal and educational institutions shape the everyday experiences of poor minority and immigrant youth along the life course. He has an extensive biographical resume and uh, many accomplishments, but instead of uh, wasting his time with further description of his stellar trajectory, <coughs> let me give him the floor. His presentation is entitled, most originally, The Law and the Clock, Undocumented Immigrants, Youth, and the Transition to Illegality. Please help me welcome Professor Gonzalez. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia, for the very, very, very kind introduction. And, and, and thank you both, Petty and, and, and the people. You look in terms of intergenerational mobility. Um, scholars, Frank Bean and others, argue that for certain groups, undocumented immigrants, uh, Mexican Americans, that uh, over the course of three or four generations uh, may enter into the mainstream. Right? Um, there, are, there are folks in the room um, who have different ideas and have found um, uh, very, very different findings in terms of, of Mexicans in particular across generations. Um, policymakers will stress that change takes time and that the policy process is incremental. These ideas are really important and all fine and good, but these ideas don't square with the experiences of the young people that I've been, uh, that I've spent the last 12 years talking to. Think back to 2001. 2001 um, before September 11th, there was a lot of hope to pass um, a DREAM Act. So this legislation introduced 14 years ago to provide a pathway to legalization for um, young immigrants who came to the U.S. at young ages. Right. Um, it's been 14 long years, and meanwhile, these young people have played the waiting game. 14 years um, is about 5,000 days. So 5,000 days navigating um, very difficult, untenable circumstances between illegality and belonging. So my study very briefly, um, again, began in, in late 2002, early 2003. Um, I carried out my last follow-ups uh, in November of 2014. Um, I followed uh, 150 um, young adults. Most of them are in their 30s now. Um, all of these young people came to the U.S. before the age of 20, around 14, 15, 16 years old. Um, this is the early to mid-90s, and so there's no in-state tuition in the state of Illinois. Uh, while there was an awareness of undocumented communities, there was little work being done on behalf of undocumented children. And it really wasn't an issue that people were paying attention to. Nevertheless, these young people were, um, uh, were confronting some very, very uh, serious circumstances as they came of age. Um, fast forward a few years and I find myself in, in graduate school um, in California. Um, and I start hanging out in Santa Ana, California. Any, any folks from the West Coast here? Santa Ana Unified um, school system is about 92% Latino, high 80% free or reduced lunches, um, high immigrant population, many undocumented families. And so I started meeting young people with very similar trajectories. Had come to the U.S. at six months old, two years old, five years old, had grown up side by side with American-born 
peers, but again at around 14, 15, 16 years old, as their friends were starting to get driver's licenses, getting their first jobs, um, getting financial aid for college, starting their careers, they stayed stuck. Um, so it's this context that I want to talk about, um, the research that I began in 2003. Um, so I've been following a group of, of uh, about 150 young adults uh, since late 2002, early 2003. Um, and so I want to share what I've learned in the last 12, uh, 12 years. So I mentioned time. So as I mentioned before, time uh, is often a central variable. Sociologists, scholars of immigration, um, in thinking about immigrant incorporation and adaptation, um, time is looked at as a, as a central variable. Often we